I dreamt last night the moon was so bright it melted the world away. Dream Journal July 26th, 2020 I am sleeping in bed reading a book. It is my friend Maria's house and I see her going about her daily activities. I get up and walk around. I lift a part of the mattress and see lots of dirt underneath. Maria has not had time to clean the house because of the quarantine, I think to myself. A young man walks in. He looks really tired and jumps onto the bed next to me. There is a sudden sense of panic. I have to get my family out of here, otherwise we will all start bloating up. I'm frantically packing some books in a bag. The bag is transparent. I gather my kids and we are about to leave when Maria walks in. We tell her we are going to escape. She says, but that's my book. I explain to her that all the books look the same. Her book is still on the bed where the strange man is sleeping. We then run out. There is a giant boat on the road and we all have to get in it to escape. There are people bloating up like balloons all over the street. We have to avoid them. I manage to push my daughter onto the boat even though she doesn't want to go. Then I feel myself expanding. pandemic caught me off guard like where the hell did it come from and what the hell were we supposed to do like just stay in the house for how long and can we just lock our doors and be safe huh. well I just went into survival mode and hunkered down I was scared so we just got all the supplies that we needed like water and food and at first, we made these masks out of old pieces of cloth and bandanas. You know, that's the time when they said we didn't need masks. I cooked and cooked and cooked because we were not going into these COVID streets eating at COVID restaurants because COVID, as far as I was concerned, was lurking in cracks and crevices. So I cooked, we ate, I cooked, we ate, we took walks, we sat at the beach, and I couldn't sleep the whole night through. I would wake up like every three hours and that's when I started dreaming.
And my dreams were not those beautiful picturesque dreams of floating underwater, connecting with a big hunk of sexual chocolate, locked in a kiss that was for eternity. No, instead my dreams were these random mundane dreams of things like plaque. Yes, P-L-A-Q-U-E, plaque. Waitress, water, baby carriages, Berlin and Buffalo, young men, and my grandfather, and I went to the bathroom instead of flying. Like, he was sick, and he was just, they were like, and one of them sort of was a dog, each had a dog, and we were with very, very short legs, like a normal... Each of them did. And then there were... <sighs> so that one had like this I think I was, but the, um, in the middle of the night, in the evening on Friday, it was the, um, standing almost in the fetal position, strapped in, and, um, um, a very elaborate, I don't know, past nostalgic for and and also familiar and foreign at the same time in my dream i take a walk along the river by my house and i take the same walk every day and every day I see the same blonde haired sort of older boy, young teen, hanging out by the edge of this river. And I assume he's homeless because some people live down there when they have no place to go. And he just seems really isolated and sad and lonely. And occasionally there's this sort of hulking big guy that stays with him. And I think of him as the troll came out from under the bridge and it makes me feel protective of this kid so I'm always trying to make eye contact with him and smile and say hello and just generally send him good vibes and I realized one day that the kid is Baron Trump and the big guy the troll is Donald and it makes me feel even more protective of this kid and I invite him and Donald back to my house for a barbecue that I'm having and they enter the backyard and 
all of my friends look and are horrified to realize that I've brought Donald Trump home. And Baron kind of goes and gets food and takes a plate and sits at the table and starts eating. But Donald just plops himself at the end of the furthest bench, you know, with his elbows on the table as though he kind of owns the place and looking both defiant and miserable. And that's the end of the dream, I think. And I start having another dream, but then I realize in that dream that I had forgotten the actual end of my first dream. And that the last shot of my first dream is actually Donald at the end of that bench, him against the world. And then someone comes up behind him with a huge rock and smashes him in the head. Thank you, Lord, for all my fun. See you with the morning sun. And that's the end of my dream. to make you dictator of Moronica. Dictator? What does a dictator do? A dictator? Why, he makes love to beautiful women, drinks champagne, enjoys life, and never works. He makes speeches to the people, promising them plenty, gives them nothing, then takes everything. That's a dictator. Hmm, a parasite. That's for me. Quiet. I must think. Quiet while I think. I must think. Let me see. Two little babies, one was like newborn and the other was probably two. And I, both of them I was able to talk to. And they were both nursing um, on and off throughout the dream. And my milk was. At points, not really coming out so much. So I was trying to squeeze it and have my milk flow. And at one point, I was on a boat, like a big, sh like a ship. So like between a sailboat and a ship, and it belonged to Joel and Avi, and w was the three of us on it together. And uh, Avi was driving it, and it, we were in these huge, huge waves, and like just the boat started to f like kind of capsize and fill with water. We were like just going on these gigantic waves. Um, and she was bringing out all these different, like in between that, she was bringing out all these different um, outfits, like really, really fancy dresses that she was wearing. And also, some hand-me-downs for me to look through, like a bag of things. She didn't want any more to be looked through. And... I think I had a few different men in my life 
None of them were. Like, stable or actually available for partnership. And I guess my focus was these little kids that I was trying to nurse, trying to be a mother to. So I was in this place that I was really unfamiliar with. I didn't know where it was. It was really confusing, but it was like a cave, but I've really never been in a cave, so I couldn't really say it was a cave, but it was what I imagined it would be like. I just kept walking and walking and walking. And it just seemed like there was no end to this place until I got to the end. And when I was walking and got to the end, I was boarded up. Until I got to the end, but it was like, and walking when I was walking and in, got to the end, it just seemed like there was no border in this place. Until I got to the end. Monday, 622, I'm kind of a private investigator, a PI, 
there are items placed along the wall. I look at each one, pick it up and put it back down. Lettuce, shoes, portable sewing machine, bowling ball. I slice some of them in half. For example, the bowling ball and the sewing machine. I examine the inside of each of these items in a glance. And then I replace the halves, putting it down, and I look at the next item. I don't find it, the thing that I need. Suddenly, down the stairs, at the bottom of a corridor, I open the door. It's bright outside. Nothing. I wonder if I can get away. University. You are the students. Here is another student. Here is an adjunct instructor. What, what is, is an, an adjunct? adjunct? An adjunct is a contractual employee without the benefits of traditional job security. Adjuncts now constitute over half of the teaching workforce in our commodity-driven, neoliberal, educational system. They get paid less than minimum wage. In short, an adjunct is like a knowledge stripper who doesn't get tipped. Act 1, the adjunct teaches a class. Professor, can I meet you after class in your office? I had questions about that last assignment. I would love to meet, but I don't have an office. We could meet in the broom closet if you want, or on a bench in the park, or we could meet here in the hallway. Okay, thanks, Professor. 
Hello class, today we're going to be talking about three-act structure. Act 1, exposition. Act 2, conflict. Knock, knock. Oh, excuse me. I'm just giving a tour to a prospective donor. Oh, hi, Dean Scott. No problem. Oh, thank you so much. This is one of our latest smart classrooms. In addition to the sports complex we just saw, we're putting a lot of resources into high-tech learning spaces. This will allow a seamless transition to online instruction. Theoretically, our students and our instructors can be anywhere in the world. The savings will be enormous. Uh, okay, where were we? Uh, act two, conflict. Act three, climax and resolution what's sometimes called the denouement of the film or the unraveling of the plot at the end. Any questions so far? Can, Can you run, run a university, university like, like a business? A society that claims to value education cannot systematically exploit its educational class. While colleges rely more and more on low-paid, contingent faculty, college tuition has tripled and administrative salaries have quadrupled. Money has no mission except its own. Act two, the adjunct becomes an activist. Are there any more questions before we storm the dean's office? What are we actually gonna do once we get there? Good question. We'll all need to be on the same page. I just suggest you tell your own stories. Like you, Jane, you're struggling to pay for daycare for your daughter, which is just as much as your TA salary. Or you, Pete, you teach at four different colleges, and your car broke down, and you had no way to get to work. Then we'll get back to our main agenda. Job security and better pay. We teach. We grade. Adjuncts need a living wage. We teach. We grade. Adjuncts need a living wage. We teach. We grade. Adjuncts need a living wage. Social change is possible. If we unite, our goals will be attained. There is power in numbers. Hope is just a beginning, not the end. Organized protest leads to transformational change. Act 3. The adjunct gets a tenure track teaching position. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm so honored. We're so happy to have you on board. Wow. Look at this. Computer, a big desk, it's a real office and it's all for me. Excuse me, would you like to come to our meeting? We're addressing the plight of contingent faculty and it would be so great if we had tenure track allies. Thank you, great that you're doing this. I'll definitely try to make it, if I have time. Time, I wish I had more of it. I do care. But I've got more important fish to fry right now. Class prep, writing, committees. I don't even know where to start. Contingent faculty exploitation is not going to go away anytime soon. Plus, I've got to think about my tenure dossier. I mean, I'll continue the struggle after I get tenure. It makes much more sense. I paid my dues, and I worked so hard to get here. Not too long ago, you were an adjunct as well. What are you going to do? How do you negotiate between your personal goals and systemic injustice? What is more important, to look out for yourself or for those that come after you? It feels like you are, but you are not the last adjunct.
night the moon was so bright it melted the walls away My sister and I are walking in a large urban forest that's cut through by a massive multi-lane park drive. We must time our run across the wide road in order to avoid getting hit by cars with no mercy for pedestrians. I feel my difference and inferiority walking on foot in a land shaped for the convenience of cars. and cars feel no obligation to stop. They have the rules and custom in their favor, so I must wait for a lull, must understand the rhythm of fast-moving traffic. It is like crossing Cobbs Creek Parkway to get to Mount Moriah Cemetery to lay flowers for a relative, or the Bois de Vincennes, interrupted by a ring road of cars. New cross. On the other side of the road is a circular nature trail. A woman with what is called white skin. A woman with white skin and with straggly brown hair is on the path below, walking in the other direction. She looks at me and asks me to help pull her up to our level. She extends her hand, really her fingers, for me to pull her up. I reach to pull her up by her extended fingers. She starts screaming that I'm attacking her, but it's actually, but it's actually her who won't let go of my hand. I'm aware that I am an other, an outsider. She is full of menace and anger. All this while she is screaming. She wants to hurt me. My roommate and I were skateboarding all over the city, exploring all day. As it got darker, my roommate got scared and ditched me to go home. I called for her to wait, but she was too fast and we got separated, and I was left alone in a rough looking neighborhood. It was weird. It was like the buildings and the overall aesthetic was like cyberpunk like loose wires and pipes and neon signs. That familiar terror crept in and I was preparing myself for the worst or to wake myself up. But the bad thing didn't happen because a man on a brown horse approached me and the clothes he was wearing were like dirty post-apocalyptic cyberpunk garb. He asked if I was okay. Before I could answer, there was commotion and noise behind us, like men shouting, metal clanking, and the man swooped me up on his horse and we galloped away to his home. The man's home was like in a trippy kaleidoscope hole in the wall where each little geometric light fragment was an individual apartment. He let me stay there until morning. I couldn't say what we talked about, but I know we did all night. Then I was at work. 
at the flower shop, but it was different. It was also like cyberpunky and in the middle of the city instead of in the suburbs like it is in real life. Same aesthetic, gray and blue metal, loose hanging wires, pipes, etc. My boss was there. I'm not the biggest fan of him in real life and that was reflected in the dream too. He had been talking to my manager that he couldn't find his son and that he couldn't contact him. I was eavesdropping, but my boss caught me, and I guess in the dream I was someone who knew how to find people because my boss asked me to look for his son. I told him I would. He described what he looked like. I changed the light bulb in the bathroom and thought hard about the description. It sounded familiar. The man on the horse. I popped out of the bathroom and asked my boss, who was making a flower arrangement, what if he doesn't want to come home? My boss didn't answer. He didn't even look at me, and I waited a few minutes before I continued. Should I just tell you where he is anyway? He snapped. Did I say that? You didn't say anything. Dream Journal, June 25th, 2020. I am waiting in line at the post office. A man in uniform walks in with a large white trash bag. He grabs the envelope I'm holding and then starts grabbing all the mail from people and stuffing them into the trash bag. Bunches of white envelopes all stuffed into a trash bag. He drags the bag on the floor towards the glass doors. What is going on? I ask. He's stealing our votes, someone yells. It is early morning of the first Tuesday in November. Tremendous corruption. This man is casting his vote for a government of his own choosing under the Constitution of the United States. Don't let COVID-19 take away your right to vote. Tremendous corruption. Tremendous is a joke. Corruption. Click apply now for a million ballot. The mailman stops at the mailboxes he passes to pick up outgoing mail. He will carry them back to the post office to be President sent out. President Trump lashes out at the U.S. Postal Service as the pandemic brings it to the brink of collapse. Let's go behind this wall. Tremendous corruption. Tremendous is a joke. Corruption. is emptied onto a sorting table. What would happen to this country if the Postal Service went out of business? In the circle is the name of the post office, the time the letter was canceled, and the date on which it was canceled. This is called a postmark. Here you have an institution one year older than the country itself. If Congress doesn't step up, the post office could die. And so, the postal transportation clerks keep working as the train rolls along. So, I went on the bus, I think something happened on the bus. I don't remember. Something happened. And I had like a little pouch, I didn't have a backpack or anything. Like, I literally had a little pouch, and I was just bringing it to school, like, oh, I don't need a backpack. So then I went into school, and there was all, like, there was so much ice everywhere. There was, like, ice. And everyone was wearing ice skates and, like, I, like going down the ice. I was, like, so confused, and I was like, I want to go on the ice. So then I took off my shoes, and I went with my socks, and I was like, running in the ice and then the school started and I had to run with my socks on and it took forever and there was some reason there was ice in the school I don't really know like a little bit and we went on to this ramp and then I was like oh finally I made it and then I was like wait there I forgot my socks I mean my shoes so then someone had to bring it for me and then and then we all sat down and everyone and then the teacher's like we went into the building, and it's usually like, oh, you had to put on your masks. And then I looked through my pouch, and I had, like, wipes and stuff and hand sanitizer, but I didn't have a mask. And I, <laughs> I got in so much trouble, so embarrassing. And then what happened after that? And hope wasn't how 
packing up to leave and she was taking to me to meet all these little amazing little diners and cafes and bars that I'd never been to before that were really really good and we were at this little cafe that she had taken me to having coffee and I was ordering my coffee and I was trying to she ordered hers in German and I was trying to order mine in German and I couldn't I was stumbling over it because I was so out of practice The there was a young woman barista waitress and an old woman waitress who were both waiting on our table making our drinks for us and they were making it and um I took mine and took a drink of it but and I didn't realize that it wasn't ready yet and when I took a drink of it it was just like water with ice cubes floating in it because it wasn't ready um and then there were these two young men who were passing us. We were sitting on like this balcony that was both inside and outside. It was both elevated and somehow connected to the ground level. And these two young guys each had a dog. And then there was a scene where I went home really, really late in the middle of the night and I went to the bathroom and my grandfather was lying in the fetal position next to the bath, the toilet. Like he was sick and he was just sleeping next to the toilet in case he had to get sick again. And then when I went back in the next time, my mother and my grandmother were also there lying next to the toilet. But, and they were all sleeping and somehow I knew that my grandmother and my mother were there to take care of my grandmother or my grandfather who was sick. There's no friends on my friends and my friends on the friends. No, we did it all the happy or will be. Hello? Hello? And then look at us. Lindsay, chin down. Dorothea, chin down a little. And then look back at each other. And walk towards each other again. So what was your dream again? So I dreamed that um, 
I was cleaning like some kind of windowsill and there were like a lot of snails on the windowsill and my mother was there and and I looked at all the snails and it was some kind of end of the world scenario and and I looked at the snails and I said to my mother uh do you think that um do you think we could survive if we would only have snails to eat and then she just kind of laughed and looked at me and winked and and she said well there's only one way to find out So what do you think this dream means? And put both of your arms up in the air. I mean, you never know because dreams could mean nothing. And just let yourself blow in the wind a little bit. But if if you're really thinking about it, maybe it means that um, that was something that you learned from your mom like even though you maybe weren't the closest in other ways it was something that she taught you was to like just do whatever you want if you want to do it otherwise you won't know what will happen if you didn't do it and I feel like that is something that I could see you learning from your mom even if you guys fought sometimes or weren't the closest sometimes because I feel like that's something that you guys have in common and I feel like that's something that you you like follow in your life that's something that you ha live by kind of uh, you mean trying things out or yeah like trying things even if you don't know what's gonna happen I mean I'm curious that you think that I fought a lot with my mother Okay, well, I'm not saying you fought with your mother, but you, you've you told me, like, you guys were distant at times or something. Not all the time. You guys were also close. Like, you had a good relationship. But that was something that you always shared. And, like, hopping and waving and... Yeah, perfect. We were traveling. I don't know where we were. I see a map and I see sort of, you know, point to point on the map. We were in this city. It had something to this do with place. these three regulations about plans for the university to go back and how to deal with the virus and we all sat down and, everyone, and then the teacher's like we went into the building and the teacher's the like oh you had to put on your masks and then I looked through my pouch and I had like wipes and stuff and hand sanitizer but I didn't have a mask and I, <laughs> I got in so much trouble so embarrassing and then what I think I was in a city that oh, yeah, I was yeah. both was like nostalgic for and saying goodbye to through hope saying goodbye to it and also familiar and foreign at the same time um, I just had a dream <laughs> let's see we were at some kind of restaurant or Maybe it's kind of like a club. It's Dorothea and Greta and... And then later in that dream, two, we got back Greta's to this place. Friend. It was a it was a Korean house yeah. that I was trying to sell. And it wasn't very fancy, like, compared to all of the other Korean houses. And there were these... It was like an open house and this... This is my family. This is my mother. 
my sister, my other sister, and me. Recently, we saw a lot of each other because we had to clean out my mother's house and sell it. In the process of doing this, we started fighting. These are ten short documentaries about the process of selling the house and fighting. And this is the first documentary. My mother and me are visiting our house one last time. The house is already sold, but my mother kept the key. For this last walkthrough, we are meeting Michi, the family friend and neighbor we grew up with. <laughs> I had wanted to make this a special occasion, one last walk through with my mother, one last shared memory of the house. But then I got distracted and started talking with Michi while my mother was in the house alone. Michi and I were reminiscing about the time we had founded this club called WWTH. We want to help animals. We spent all our time sitting in this little space under the roof of our shed discussing our ideas how to help animals. Yeah, and we were here and we talked about WWTH, but actually... Genau, das war der, das war der, das war der Meeting Room. <lacht> Was haben wir denn gemacht, da wenn wir nur darüber geredet, dass wir gerne, also ich weiß noch, wie ich immer einen Affen finden wollte. <lacht> da kannst du lang suchen hier. Later I felt a little guilty that I had preferred the giggly company of Michi to that of my mother. Yes, we all started fighting, not about the things, the many beautiful paintings and objects that my mother collected over the past 40 years. Instead, we fought about the process, who does what and how much and why. It was as if by disrupting those objects that had stayed so long in one place, those pieces of furniture that we grew up around, we'd uncovered all those hurt feelings, all those misunderstandings, resentments and arguments that were never won. Du musst mir jetzt noch kurz erklären, was dieses lustige Bildchen heißt. Ich, ich wollte die Gerechtigkeit darstellen. Mit das heißt, blinden Augen. Ja, ja, ich denke immer, sad, was ist denn so traurig? Ob es mir dann dämmerte, dass es Silke Annette Dohr liegt. Ja, dann. heißt es, ja. Und, und der Kopf ist ja total breit geraten. Das bist du. Ja, nein, das ist die Gerechtigkeit. Ach so, also das aber ist wieso ist die Gerechtigkeit blind? Die ist so. Sad. Ja. 
Es war ja auch nicht eine Zeit, die jetzt irgendwie nur von einzelnen, von wunderschönen Erlebnissen bei uns geprägt war. Here my sister and mother are discussing everything that happened. My sister feels resentful because she was accused of not doing enough. She feels like my mother and my other sister ganged up on her. Later I will tell my version of the story. It was the first time we talked about this. The house was like a timeless oasis in an otherwise hectic world. It was a place to dream and play. Even long after I moved out, every time I came back to visit, it felt like another world, a world where afternoons drift by like butterflies and days disappear in a huge dark hole, where the only thing that really mattered was going for walks with the dogs. The house was a dream house, a place where time stood still. Perhaps my mother fell into some kind of sleeping beauty sleep after my father died. All of a sudden she found herself alone, trying to raise three unruly, willful daughters. It wasn't what she had in mind. I'm not sure what she had in mind. She never remarried. She always talks about finishing the project she was working on with my father. But she never quite gets around to it. She likes to start projects, but she doesn't like to finish them, as if finishing them would ground them in a specific time and place. It would make them too real, too solid, less than the ideals she had in mind. Maybe that's right, finishing a project is like saying you have an answer, which when spoken aloud just doesn't ring true or leaves so much out or misses the point.